He has been uh, one of the most vigorous voices in both our internal debate and the external discussion. Uh, so even though it sounds a little incestuous to have one of our other people comment on Simon, I assure you it's not, as Simon told you. And so I want to bring Morris with his wealth of experience and background and uh, analysis on these issues to the podium to lead off our discussion. As most of you know, before Morris joined the Institute in 1994 as a senior fellow, he had spent 25 years at the IMF. The last seven of those were as deputy director of the research department, where he also led the capital markets missions to a whole slew of countries and knows the financial markets like very few other people. So Morris, you lead off the discussion, then you and I and Simon will go up front and we'll open it to the audience. Thank you, Fred. Uh, good afternoon. And let me add my welcome uh, to those of Fred and Simon. Uh, I've been asked to lead off the discussion and highlight some of the issues raised in 13 Bankers. Uh, I won't hold you in suspense. I think this is a terrific book that offers a much needed political economy perspective on how we got into this crisis and how we can avoid a repetition. In my remarks, I want to do two things. First, I want to explain briefly why I like it so much. And second, uh, I want to take up uh, several policy issues, particularly how do we fix the system, where I have somewhat uh, different emphasis, at least, than Simon and Jim. OK, why do I uh, say that this is a terrific book? Well, when you read most accounts of the origins of this uh, crisis, you get the by now familiar uh, suspects, namely some combination of the following. Faulty assumptions about the continued upward path of US housing prices, large global payments imbalances that led to easy credit availability, low long-term interest rates, and a search for yield in the US, overly lax US monetary policy in the run-up to the crisis, poor performance by conflict of interest and excessive reliance on the major credit rating agencies, rapid growth in complex and opaque financial products, particularly CDOs and credit default swaps, unwarranted complacency toward risk and macroeconomic outcomes with the advent of the great moderation, a failure to see executive compensation practices as part of risk management, a long-running trend in large banks and in investment banks toward economizing on own liquid assets in favor of collateralized borrowing, uh, particularly at the short end, uh, much lower underwriting standards, lack of consumer protection, rapid growth in the subprime market, and last but not least, a generalized failure to update and enforce sound financial regulation and supervision and to regard self-regulation as a superior alternative. Now, I regard each of those sort of conventional origins of the crisis as significant and as playing a, a role. But what they leave out is how these mistaken assumptions, views, and market practices came to be so widely endorsed. Uh, put in other words, why did so much of the influential economic and political elite drink the Kool-Aid? And this is where Simon and Jim, I think, add real value by looking at, in some depth, at how attitudes about risk management and regulation changed, and by focusing on the role of the large financial institutions in that shift, be it a view that financial innovation was almost always good, that the market almost always uh, set prices at the right level, that a continually rising share of home ownership was a worthwhile objective, that securitization would shift risks to those who could bear it safely, and that uh, self-regulation of financial markets was effective, uh, and that good firms uh, had too much to lose to act imprudently. To do this, uh, Simon and Jim look at some uh, developments that are often given less attention in typical economic studies. For example, they uh, look at the role of campaign contributions to uh, Congress. They look at the two-way corridor between Wall Street and senior economic policy positions in Washington under both administrations, Republican and Democratic. They trace out how, what the influence of 
President Reagan and Fed Chairman Greenspan were in forging a consensus on deregulation and uh, how this regulation was reflected in legislation and not just uh, uh, Graham Leach Bliley, but others. And they show how concentration in the U.S. banking in industry increased uh, over the past 25 years. So that by March of 2009, you had three banks, U.S. banks, with assets equal to 12% or more of U.S. GDP, when in 1983, the largest U.S. bank, Citibank, had assets equal to only 3% of GDP. Yes, at times, uh, the narrative presented by Simon and Jim goes, I think, a little over the top. Uh, it's a little bit across between the old TV show Mission Impossible and the Manchurian Candidate. <laughs> and I, I'm sure when they kind of uh, make, when Oliver Stone directs the movie version <laughs> of uh, uh, 13 Bankers, I can envisage the following scene. Uh, this will be in the Wall Street boardroom. And the uh, fellow leading the meeting says, uh, okay, listen up. I want to go over once again what our long-term business plan is. Uh, Fisher Black, I want you to work with Myron here in devising a uh, options pricing formula that will spawn enormous growth in derivatives. Uh, we're going to make a real killing on that, uh, particularly the over-the-counter stuff. Uh, Gene Pham, I want you to show that financial markets are highly uh, efficient. Uh, that will squash any talk of bubbles and that the market ever getting it wrong. Uh, Ronnie, of course, you have the biggest responsibility. You're going to be president. Uh, uh, in addition to railing against uh, communism and the Berlin Wall, the main evil you're going to talk about is excessive financial regulation. Uh, Alan, uh, you're going to be Fed chairman, uh, believe it or not. And your job is uh, uh, going to be to cast re official regulation as uh, as ineffective, and self-regulation would be better. Go light on the Ayn Rand stuff that makes people nervous. Uh, a little bit later, we're going to be, uh, bring Bob Rubin in, into town, and he's going to train the next two Treasury secretaries. Uh, by training them, I mean he, we're going to have a small device uh, implanted in each of them. And whenever they hear the word financial innovation, they're going to immediately reflexively say, good for America, good for the world. <laughs> and of course, it will be good for us, that is, for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> uh, so, you know, whatever Simon said about the conspiracy, it goes a little bit sometimes over the top. But I think if you read the arguments in the book, uh, I, I think they are persuasive that these are things that one uh, ought to be looking at. The second thing I really like about the book is the strong push the authors make for size limits on assets relative to GDP for commercial and investment banks. While many see size limits as unnecessary, counterproductive, or unrealistic, uh, I see them as a key element in addressing the too big to fail uh, problem. On uh, that score, I would just mention the following arguments, some of which Simon touched on too. Even if one maintains that it is interconnectedness and complexity that are the keys to systemic risk, not size alone. If you make a list of the most interconnected and complex financial institutions, the large institutions are going to be at the top of that list. If you look at the expected cost of failure, it's the product of the probability of failure times the cost of failure when that when failure occurs. And even if you believe that large institutions don't have a higher probability of failure than small ones, once they fail, the cost is much bigger because their balance sheets are just enormous. And if you doubt that, you can ask Iceland, Ireland, Switzerland, and the UK, among others. There is no evidence, as Simon mentioned, of economies of scale for, for banks beyond $100 billion of assets. Uh, it's true, yes, banks can follow their international clients, but there's no reason to argue that those clients' needs can't be met by a consortium of medium-sized banks. Uh, yes, we in the U.S. have had crises like the SNL crisis that was primarily composed of a, a lot of failures by smaller institutions, but we don't know what the next crisis will uh, be like, and we ought to have protections on both sides, both for crises that might be caused by large institutions and small ones. But you might say, well, why is the Johnson-Platt proposal on size limits noteworthy? Uh, 
Uh, aren't size limits also part of the Volcker rule? And aren't they in the administ some of the administrations of reform bills? Yes, the Volcker rule has size limits, but those are written relative to the liabilities of the financial sector rather than to GDP. And what's most amazing, and you heard this in Under Secretary Wolin's testimony uh, when they discussed uh, the Volcker rule in Congress, uh, they want to cap those in a non-binding way so that nobody has to get smaller right now. So they're non-binding. Uh, well, you know, it seems to me if you buy the argument for size and after the experience of this crisis, why would you want to cap them at the existing uh, uh, size that, that, that we have? I mean, this strikes me as a very weak argument and indeed reminds me of a short story. Everything reminds me of a story, but uh, it's about a guy who goes into a bar every day at the same time and he, two o'clock, and he orders three shots of whiskey. Well, the bartender sees this happen uh, over a course of a few weeks and finally his curiosity gets to him and he says, uh, why do you do this? And he says, well, I have two brothers who are very close. We live all around the world and in order to show our solidarity, we do this every day and we have the three shots. This goes on for a number of weeks until at one point the bartender notices that the fellow has started ordering two shots of whiskey. So doesn't say anything. Finally, he says, I don't want to pry, but I noticed you switch from three shots of whiskey to two. Uh, is, any, is everything okay with your brothers? Is there any problem? He says, oh, no, no, my brothers are fine. I've switched to two shots of whiskey because I quit drinking. <laughs> That's what the size, what the proposal to cap size limits at the existing size is. You know, they quit drinking at at, at this size. So this makes uh, this makes no uh, uh, no sense. I think so. Much as I like, uh, so much for why I like the book uh, and why I encourage you to read it. Uh, that said, it does not mean that, that if I say I like it, that I don't have any disagreements with it. And let me mention uh, just a couple of issues. Uh, uh, Johnson and Quack dismissed most of the other approaches to confronting too big to fail as, quote, technical solutions that won't have much bite. Here, technical is used in the same way that people often use academic, in a sort of deprecating <laughs> way. Uh, 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 in contrast, I favor a belt and uh, braces approach to confronting too big to fail uh, that, in addition to size caps, would include the following tougher capital, liquidity, and leverage requirements on larger financial institutions to internalize the externalities associated with failure, mandatory wind-down plans that need to be approved by the regulator, and if the regulator is not satisfied, then those institutions uh, have to shrink and become uh, less complex, resolution authority for systemically important non-banks that's oriented toward liquidation rather than conservatorship, that docks uh, shareholders, dismisses old management, pays off creditors at estimated recovery costs, not at par, and that is paid for by a combination of an ex ante and ex post assessment on the financial sector. If the main worry about size is uh, that it will result in socializing losses and privatizing gains, why doesn't that kind of regime help? And uh, I think saying, well, all oh, that's, that's, that's not, we're not going to get it is. Uh, uh, I, I take a differing view. I think we want to have a combination of those things because none of the measures uh, is either likely to be effective enough or saleable, saleable enough on its own to do the job. A second place where I think Simon is being a bit unfair is when he accuses the current administration of missing the opportunity to implement real reform. Here it's my recollection that after the crisis uh, broke out, Simon was one of the people saying, well, you know, we really even shouldn't be talking about reform early on because it's going to be pro-cyclical and we've got to get out of the recovery. So even having any discussion of that uh, is ill-placed at, uh, at this time. I was on one of the people on the other side of that debate. I thought it was better to set out a plan and then agree to implement it after, we, after the recovery was in train. But I think if you were on that side, it's hard to say, well, they missed the case. Now, maybe what Simon and Jim mean is, well, they had a chance to nationalize the banks uh, when they were at their weakest and they didn't, uh, and they didn't do it. Simon, I think, was also uh, a bit skeptical about the stress tests. Well, I think if what you look, looked at what's happened since then, uh, I don't think nationalizing looks so good. 
uh, the stress tests have come out better. And again, I'm for size caps and shrinking the size of these large institutions over a period, say, a decade. Better to do it now than to have done it uh, then, uh, when you were in the middle uh, 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 of the crisis. So there's a difference. Third and finally, in terms of reform, uh, I think Simon and Jim don't give nearly enough attention to it. Identify and pricking asset price bubbles with methods other than interest rates. That is uh, some combination of countercyclical changes um, in capital liquidity and leverage requirements, changes in loan value ratios, margin requirements. Much of this crisis is about the cost of the collapsing bubble, particularly the housing market. And if you get at that earlier, that's not small technical stuff. That's big stuff. So some differences, but let me reiterate again, I think this is a terrific book that fills a hole. I encourage you to read it. Simon and Morris for leading us off. Um, before I open up to the audience, let me give Simon a shot at coming back at Morris. Particularly on his first criticism where he said you were too monotheistic, size caps were the big thing. He says, how about a broader portfolio of responses? He ticked off a number. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, I, I always listen very, very closely to what Morris uh, says, and I think the fact that Morris is endorsing and pushing for size caps uh, to me uh, speaks volume about volumes about where the debate um, has gone and, and where it's going. I, I don't disagree with the idea we should have fail safes. We should have multiple approaches uh, to this, um, and uh, I, I, none of the points that Morris struck me uh, said struck me as being irrelevant or, or unimportant. We're not saying that making the biggest banks smaller. Uh, would be sufficient to prevent another crisis. We're saying it's necessary. And we're saying, if you like, it's a blind spot in the current discussion and a, and a blind spot in, in the legislation. And I think there we, we, we absolutely agree with Morris. Let me just ask for one clarification. Morris, almost in passing, said that he would like to bring the banks down to the hard cap limits uh, over a period of 10 years. The inference I drew from you is you'd want to do it faster, but if you kind of work through a, a scheme for how you would implement your too big to fail remedy, your hard caps, and uh, over what time period you think that could be feasibly done? Well, I think over a, uh, in terms of feasibility, over a three to four year time period, if you said there's a cap, you must comply with it, you have a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders to comply with it in a way that uh, they, they don't lose money on, or you try not to make sure they don't lose money. And these banks are quite capable of breaking themselves up. Jamie Dimon, when, when he presents um, the results, of JP Morgan Chase, and she talks about the six different parts of the business, and then he tells a story about how they all fit together. I think that story is not very impressive from a social point of view. So I, these people do run their business in, in you know, somewhat seg segmented manner. Uh, the, 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 the link from retail banking to global investment banking is, is pretty tenuous. And I think it's, uh, you, you force them to comply, you give them some time to do it. Ten years strikes me as rather too long. A lot of things can happen over a ten year period. I think it needs to be a little, a little closer. And why don't you reiterate, I don't think you said it orally, I know it's in the book, and it's put forcefully, why don't you just reiterate so everybody knows the magnitude of the size caps that you're recommending, and then maybe get Morris to say how he thinks those uh, magnitudes work. So the, the headline uh, numbers we propose are that the banks would choose whether they want to be, let's call them boring banks, means they run the payment system, they have insured deposits. Those could be, they also have more controls over what they hold on the asset side. Uh, those could be uh, up to 4% of GDP. And more risky investment banks could be up to 2% of GDP. Now, I would stress, particularly for this audience, I mean, the book is written for a, a very general audience, but this audience will understand that, you, that that is a total cap on assets. Any, you would have to, to make this fair and reasonable, apply a risk adjustment to what banks actually have. So if you take a bank like Goldman Sachs, depending on the view you take of the risks it really has, this 2% 2, 2 of GDP would put them down I, w I would guess between 100 and 200 billion dollars uh, when you made the proper risk adjustment. That's still a pretty substantial bank. That's not it. We're not saying go back to community banking. Um, Goldman was a 200 billion dollar bank in 1998. That's about 270 billion in today's money. It peaked 
at the time of the crisis of 1.1 trillion. The question is, what did we gain in society from that increase to over a trillion? I think the answer is nothing, but we, we could have took a lot more social risk. So let's push them back to where they were in, in, in the mid-1990s. Morris, how do those caps sound to you? <laughs> Oh, I think reasonable. I would probably put them up a little higher, but you know, on, on this issue, we've got we've got some institutions that are 12, 13, 14 percent of uh, uh, GDP. So if you bring them down to five, you know, Simon says three, or somebody I, I say five. What's a couple hundred billion dollars between friends on this uh, on this thing? I think that's not the you know I wouldn't go to the stake for saying it should be five rather than three or whatever, but certainly much smaller than what we uh, than what we have uh, uh, what we have now. Uh, let me also say I'm unpersuaded by the argument we can't do this because other countries won't do it and therefore we'll be at a competitive disadvantage. I mean it seems. You know, that, that strikes me like the same argument that you hear from kids when they come home from summer camp. Food was terrible, and they give you such small portions. If the food is, if the food is uh, uh, terrible, we don't want bigger portions. Uh, we don't need to let them have bigger portions. Okay, things are over. Colin in the back, and they've got a lot of hands around up here in the front. Thanks, Fred. Simon, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask everybody to identify yes. and then fire away. Colin Bradford, I'm at the Brookings Institution and the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Canada. Simon, a, a daunting uh, exposition you made for us. It's the kind of thing for those of us who don't follow it the way you do, sort of suspect may be the case and fear may be the case and turns out to be the case if, according to you. So thank you very much for that. I want to ask you a, a broad question, just elaborate a tiny bit about it. And that is, from your experience, especially at the fund, what role can peer pressure from other countries play in pushing the United States towards stronger, firmer, more effective financial regulatory reform. And I, of course, have in mind the G20, both at the summit level, where financial regulatory reform, as Morris well knows, um, is, is on the agenda of the G20 summit level. The G20 in London, as you know, transformed the Financial Stability Forum into the Financial Stability For Board by giving it more teeth and inserting G20 countries into it, where there's also peer review. And then finally, of course, there's the IMF where you once were, which has the new framework for strong, sustainable, and balanced growth, which entails G20 peer review within that. And balance certainly means keeping things stable. So the question is, given the differences in, in the mix of state versus market in Asia, as opposed to the West, is there a chance that in these three sites in the international system, peer review pressure from countries that have a firmer hand on the marketplace, the financial marketplace than we do, can indeed influence our Congress, our executive branch, our public opinion in just the way you're setting it out here to act in a stronger way than we seem to be inclined to do so far. Thank you. No. <laughs> and I think it's a great question, and it is, if I could uh, plug another book, which actually is an institute book, so I know I can plug it. Arvind Subramanian and I are writing a book on the global dimensions of the of our global economy and the financial system in the aftermath of the crisis, which will link up, I think, very much with 13 bankers, but I'm sure there'll be no conspiracy at all in that movie, although Oliver Stone may, may still be interested in it. Um, and, I, and I think that it's quite interesting, if you look around the world, who has got a, who has got a grip on this issue? Who has really controlled their bankers effectively, certainly not the Europeans. Right? The Europeans have got very serious problems, for example, in the capital structure um, of big banks and small banks in, in Germany. And this is very much part of the, um, the problems, that are, the way in which problems are playing out, for example, in Greece. And I think the European economy more broadly is, is stuck in, 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 actually, we should see it as a warning for ourselves. If we don't fix this, and if we don't fix our fiscal issues, you'll get stuck in exactly this horrible combination of banks that are too big, Banks that took on the wrong kind of risk, banks that are undercapitalized, and, 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 and various dimensions of uh, fiscal problems. Uh, I, so that's the Europeans. The Asians, I think, will, will, will not have uh, much sway, much credibility on this for issues we could, we could discuss uh, separately. Uh, the G20 uh, process is important, and our book will be out in time for the uh, November summit. I'm looking at Nick Lardy. I think one might just add the Chinese banks are even bigger relative to their GDPs than the US and European banks. India is a bit different, but uh, and there's no clear model, I think, from other countries, uh, unless Colin had something different in mind. Morris, you had a comment? 
Well, I, I'm not quite as pessimistic as Simon. I think you know, we may get, in the G-Chain con context, a bank tax, which would be helpful in getting the financial sector to pay uh, more of the cost. Uh, that's important. We may get agreement on capital and liquidity requirements, you know, tougher capital and liquidity and leverage requirements. We may get something on OTC derivatives. But where I would agree with him is I think we're unlikely to get out of the G20 process anything that deals with size, size caps, because other, other countries are even, aside of the ones that have really been burnt, like the Swiss and some of the others, the Irish, uh, they're, they're not yet uh, prepared to go, uh, to go that far. Okay, question here in the middle. Uh, please introduce yourself, fire away. Uh, it's a question for Simon Hilton Root, George Mason University. Um, Simon, what experience do we have uh, to draw upon uh, with regard to uh, reducing the size of these uh, entities? Who's going to acquire the assets? How do you determine which assets go first? And uh, what would be the role of the hedge funds in in potentially acquiring the assets of these, you know, do you have a plan, uh, and, and 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 what do the various financial institutions play in that plan? Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a very fair question. I think that 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 tactical level, the uh, decisions uh, rest with the management of these of these companies. Uh, they know their businesses better than anyone, at least. We thought that before 2008, and so and so, I, I, and I think a, a process of um, divesting themselves of assets and breaking themselves up, which is not easy to do because of the cross guarantees that they have with their existing debt, so they have to change their their um, liabilities, the nature of their liabilities o over time. Um, but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's an insurmountable obstacle. Um, you know, the breakup of Standard Oil was was uh, daunting, and the breakup of other big monopolies in, in this country. Um, prior to when they actually happened, had, there were a lot of questions around how the telephone system would operate, for example, after the breakup of at and I think that those, those technical issues are, are important, but they can, they can be dealt with, and they can be dealt with in a very decentralized manner. What about the, uh, the aspect of the question, the role of hedge funds, and one might add, we have friends here, private equity funds. Uh, you might think this would, might be a natural avenue for them to uh, do their thing. I, I, right. I strongly encourage um, anyone within the financial sector who'd like to uh, take on the big banks to join us. <laughs> and look, it's not in the interest, and we have, if you look at the blurbs um, in, in the book, we very consciously sought out blurbs from people in finance, from people on the right, as well as people on the left, and many people in the center. And we actually put the blurbs not just on the back cover, but also in the front of the book, to make the point that we draw a lot of support across the spectrum. Not everyone is willing to come out in public and say this, but I find very little pushback from people who do not work at the tops of these big six banks. Even people who work in those banks you know, understand the point we're making and don't think, you know, I'm, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship, among other things, uh, at MIT, Fred, as you know. I'm not anti-finance. The people I work with, the entrepreneurs I work with, need risk capital. They need people who are willing to take risk and invest in risk. But that's not what we have now. What we have now is banks that play with house money. They're backed by the government, like a Goldman Sachs, not to pick on anyone in particular, but it is kind of striking. Goldman Sachs backs Geely Automotive to buy Volvo from Ford. That's a private equity investment by Goldman. Goldman is a bank holding company, had access to the Fed discount window. If their private equity investments broadly go well, they'll have a lot of upside. If there are problems with the risk-taking part of their portfolio, they're a bank. The downside comes onto society. That's not fair. It's not reasonable. That's not a market economy. Okay? Not, not, not any reasonable market economy. Not the way we try and structure uh, what, what happens in this country. And it should stop. Question over here. Let me, um, uh, Michael Palmer Lano with the World Bank. I, I have, obviously, I have followed Simon and Morris for many years, and I have enormous regard for their work. Uh, but I want to share one uh, puzzle or, or thing that preoccupies, and I, and I have been writing extensively about the failure of the reforms as well, probably some people saw it. Uh, here's my fundamental concern that uh, while I applaud all those meritorious efforts, uh, suspender and belt to tighten, uh, possibly uh, all those efforts uh, are bound to fail for the following reason, that ultimately, uh, and I can speak to economists, you cannot talk to regulators, I dealt with a lot of people and they are miseducated, narrow-minded regulators. 
But, but the problem is that as long as you have distortions in the real economy, which we have, the imbalances globally, the flow of funds around the globe, ultimately a financial system will mirror those distortions in the real economy. So no amount of patching <coughs> will ultimately prevent some implosion somewhere. And I wanted to get your reaction on that because I think that's at the forefront and this is not being addressed in any way. Oh, I think that's a very good point. That's a point that, that in this follow-up book with Ar Arun, uh, and, and which will involve, I think, many other people at the Institute, we'll, we'll take that on. Um, you know, I, I think if we want to sort of speculate a little bit about where, where we're going moving forward, I, I would suggest that um, the next boom could well be in emerging markets. And I would actually uh, think about the 1970s, a rerun of the version of the 1970s, where it was recycling petrodollars through uh, banks in the so-called money centers, such as London and New York, who then lent, uh, made loans, large loans to emerging markets in Latin America, and if you remember, to, to Poland and, and, and communist Romania, which was you know, just as crazy as it, as it, as it sounds. Um, I think what you'll see now is current account surpluses from the former petrodollars and from people, countries that have large manufacturing export sectors. They will park a lot of that surplus, a lot of that cash, offshore, meaning in the United States and, and in, in Europe. And you know, what's, from their perspective, what could be better than putting your money with a too-big-to-fail bank? There's an implicit government guarantee. We know, actually, from Mr. Pulse's memoir that the Chinese were very worried about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which whose paper they were holding because they felt there was a too-big-to-fail guarantee, and they were right about that. And, and now I would expect to see them lined up uh, also, putting their money also with, with, our, with our big banks. Now, that can happen, I think, that kind of round trip. And then the question is, what do our banks do? Are they careful with that money? Are they reckless with it? Well, as Chuck Prince says, said, and hope, maybe perhaps he'll say again, because he's appearing before the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission uh, this week, uh, one of the great encore performances of modern American culture, I hope. I uh, hope he'll say again that while the music's playing, you've got to get while the music's playing, you've got to get up and dance. Right? It's the incentives and the beliefs of the system. Now, I think in that round-tripping emerging market story, they have the surpluses. They also receive the loans, and it runs through our two big to fail banks. That could happen with more or less real economy distortion or imbalance. I think you could have a version of that where you would, it would actually happen with no current account, major current account imbalances, but there would still be a gross capital flow that in that structure could be destabilizing. If what you put on top of that a net capital flow because of current account imbalances, I think it probably could be more dangerous. That's an interesting question which we'll explore further in that later on. Boris, anything on that? Well, just, just briefly, I mean, I think the kinds of things that we're talking about would make the financial sector less crisis prone, and when we had a crisis, it would cost less. There are other things outside of the financial sector that also need fixing, uh, such as beggar thy neighbor exchange rate policies and the reserve accumulation and all that. That's another talk. Uh, I try occasionally to give a talk where I don't mention the Chinese exchange rate just for, uh, <laughs> but, but there, are there are other things. Uh, there are other things out there uh, that would also be helpful in making the system as a whole, that is, the monetary system and the financial system, safer, function uh, better. And some of those things are, uh, some of those things are uh, important. But uh, if we could get just some of these financial uh, uh, reform efforts in the next couple of months, uh, I'd I consider that good, uh, uh, good progress. Some of the others may take. Uh, uh, May take longer. Okay, Mike. I'm Michael Gadbaugh from the Institute of International Economic Law at Georgetown Law School. Uh, first, I want to commend you, Simon, on what is an extraordinary uh, piece of analysis and history. Uh, and I'd like perhaps to push you in a direction of your future work, and that is to comment on the relationship between the global trading system and the global finance system. Uh, from the perspective of 80 years and international regulation, it seems like we have two systems that have evolved dramatically differently. Uh, as you pointed out, on the finance side, one that is characterized by a kind of anti-regulatory uh, philosophy and, and institutions, whereas on the trade side, uh, a system that is characterized by a fairly highly developed set of rules, uh, dispute settlement, adjudication, uh, and sanctions and enforcement. Uh, so my, uh, which, which in essence go to uh, protecting the system against regulatory capture. So my questions are, uh, is it ironic that the financial world has been so, uh, such strong advocates 
for uh, controls on trade, even as they advocated against controls on regulatory capture in the financial system. Secondly, if, um, what if, if money, uh, if your thesis on money and politics is, is accurate, why hasn't industrial money been more corrupting? And if actually more industrial money is spent on protecting themselves from regulatory capture, uh, could that be steered to correcting the financial system? Uh, and thirdly, as you think about how the two systems have performed through this crisis, um, are there lessons to be drawn about the, whether the global economy can function when you have two systems that are so interrelated and so important, but that are structured so dramatically different from an international regulatory point of view? Thank you. That's a great question. That is actually what we'll talk about in our next book. Alvin Sudwani, I think, had to leave. He was here earlier. And his, his ideas and his perspective on this question is very much informs and drives um, this, work, this book we're working on. And I think there is a tension between these two systems, as you said, with the obvious, and the reason the explanation being that the, the priority uh, after World War II was to, to reestablish a robust trading system and to make sure that, there was, that finance was OK. But finance in those days was thought of primarily as making sure there was a balance of payments adjustment mechanism you couldn't get you know too much of it too much of a surplus or you got into competitive exchange rate exchange rate movements the idea that you had to manage financial flows or manage lobbies in the way that you were, you were talking about I think was, was quite foreign to the to the thinking of the 1930s and, and then as it resumed in the 1940s and, and I, I, I you know what we're suggesting when we, when we end up in the book no surprise perhaps if you, if you followed either Arvind's writing or some of my writing on this um, is that you need, we need to change the multilateral system that deals with, with finance. And we need to put that in a more WTO type of approach. And we can, we can argue, and we do argue here every Friday afternoon when it comes up, about whether that's the WTO, whether it's the WTO blended with the IMF. And you know, that, that's an interesting and open question. But I think you're right. And I think it's fascinating that the trading system and all the theory, when, when, we, when we learn trade theory, we worry a lot about specific interests, and we, these days at least, and we worry a lot about lobbies in a trade context. And of course they exist, and they're powerful, but they have not destabilized the system. Um, and yet the financial sector has played out rather differently. It has not been so effectively constrained, and we need to sort of reflect on that at a, at a global level and think about what we can do about that. It's also really interesting and strikingly that the industrial, these industrial lobbies have not fought back against finance. In France, for example, there's something people call the enterprise sector that is deeply skeptical of big banks and doesn't regard them necessarily as their friends. We don't have an enterprise, a self-identifying enterprise sector in this country. We have the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce, to, you know, which has 100,000 members, I, I can't understand, and, and neither can Treasury at this point, how the 100,000 members of the Chamber of Commerce are, are helped by sticking up for the big six banks. It doesn't make a lot of sense, actually. But somehow there is a, there is a camaraderie and, and, and there is a reluctance to criticize each other within the business sector, which may be changing. I mean, if you look at, the, again, the blurbs in our book, we have, uh, and on our website, where we have some more updated blurbs, there are, there are some powerful non-financial sector voices there who, who understand full well the danger to themselves and to their employees and to their customers caused by what has happened, or what, what is going to happen, most likely, in our financial sector. Two, two footnotes on Mike's question. The distinction that you drew between the thinking about financial regulation and trade regulation uh, is, of course, a fairly recent thing. Uh, the IMF articles not only envisage but assume the continuation of capital controls. And even advanced high-income European countries didn't really uh, eliminate their capital controls until the final fusion of the European community in the early 1990s. <coughs> All the while we were driving the trading system toward greater liberal, liberalization and opening. You might say they were converging from different points of departure, but in fact, in terms of the international rules of the game, um, it was finance that was constrained in the early days, in part to permit fixed exchange rate systems to uh, prosper, one thought, but uh, only a very recent development. So that's another element in the historical story. The second footnote is to just mention, uh, when George Shultz was Secretary of the Treasury um, in the early 1970s, he came very close to proposing in one of his annual speeches, the IMF meeting, um, that there had been a huge mistake at Bretton Woods. And the huge mistake was to link the IMF and the World Bank across the street down here, instead of linking the IMF and the GATT. And Schultz's view, which I happen to share, and we've been 
talking for five years about writing a joint piece on it, just haven't done it, was that the logical juxtaposition among the Bretton Woods institutions would be fund and WTO. And it's for the reasons that we're now beginning to talk about. Morris has written eloquently on this too. The IMF, we all know, really has no teeth in dealing with surplus and creditor countries. The WTO does, and if you could link them operationally in the way that their articles actually enunciate their link now, but have never done it, uh, then you'd have a much more effective global system. OK, we've got a lot more hands, so I'm going to ask several people to fire questions. We'll put them together and then get one set of answers. John, Bill, John. Thank you. Uh, John Maggs from National Journal. Uh, Simon, uh, if regulatory capture and indeed state capture, as the way you described it, brought us here, um, could you get more specific about uh, what needs to be done to to uh, to extricate us from this capture? And uh, I mean, the the way in which you kind of, you refer to the uh, the reform legislation that's now pending before Congress makes it sound as if because of regulatory capture, it's unlikely we could get anything that effective. Um, but specifically, what needs to get done? Is it campaign finance? Is it uh, somehow we need to build up new institutions that are independent of existing institutions? How's it going to happen? OK, Bill. <laughs> the, uh, the thing that strikes me, Simon, about this is the I think there's a disconnect between attribution of the causes of the crisis and your remedy. Uh, I see the extreme leverage, 30 to 1, uh, and the lack of regulation in kind of cases such as AIG, combined with the uh, housing market developments as, as a core. I think you can even make the case that the large banks were part of the solution as much or maybe more than part of the problem. Without J.P. Morgan, Bear Stearns would have been a crisis. Without Citigroup's willingness to take it on and then Wells Fargo stealing it away, Wachovia would have caused a big crisis. Without Bank of America taking over Merrill Lynch, Merrill Lynch would have caused a big crisis. So one would like the solution going forward to somehow reflect a bit more the origins and epicenter of the crisis. And I don't think that simplifying it for the public to too big to fail as the source of the crisis gets the job done. Because yes, Lehman was too big to fail, but it was the leverage and it was the supervision. Uh, it also, I think, is a question when the non-bank sector of credit, which has come to exceed the bank sector, is dead in the water. Uh, whether it's a great idea for the next several years to run the risk of slowing the growth of credit by taking on 60% uh, of the bank sector. Uh, and this is all being done essentially in the name of there's a, there's a crisis down the road that's going to come because these guys are too big to fail. Uh, I would be much more sympathetic, I think, with the, OK, let's get Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley out of the banks, uh, you know, the, the, the FDIC security blanket, et cetera, if they're going to continue to make so much money from trading, because I always thought you could lose money on trading, too. But uh, I'm a little bit worried about those two aspects of your storyline. This is all just to provide more empirical evidence of the vigorous debate we have here <laughs> within the Institute. Uh, John Williamson will probably add to that now. <laughs> and then Karen Johnson, and then we'll come back to the uh, speakers for final comments. <clears throat> As Grant indicated, I'm John Williamson, also at the Institute. For, uh, Simon, uh, what I'm curious about is you've talked to all the time as though the only way of controlling size was to uh, ma legislate a maximum size. And surely that isn't right. Surely there are price ways of doing it as well. For example, one could have a capital asset ratio that uh, is 8% or whatever at uh, $200 billion and then increases beyond that. And uh, that, I think, overcomes some of Bill's difficulties then. Um, why, why didn't you discuss this possibility at all? Karen. <clears throat> Karen Johnson. I was struck in your oral remarks that Lehman never got mentioned. Lehman was a searing 
episode in this crisis and looms large in the fact that we did indeed have a bankruptcy and we did indeed have a lot of costs spread by a lot of people. So, um, and it's led me, for example, to think that a winding down mechanism is, is perhaps even more important than size. With respect to your size uh, proposals, what I don't understand is exactly the mechanism that you see size being constructed. Is it that you think, well, we'll still have shocks and we'll still have financial institutions that have done wrong things, but they'll be smaller and we'll just let them fail and we could tolerate that because they'll be small? Or is it that you think putting on some kind of size limitation will change the behavior of the institutions themselves? And hence, by having the size limitations, we will have fewer risky financial institutions and fewer crises. OK, plenty of questions, Simon. Let me take those in, in reverse order, Karen. I think the, um, the, if you make these institutions small enough to fail, it will change their behavior. I, I think that you know, this is also linked to what I'm saying, what I, my, my response to Bill, which is the main concern is forward looking. We can argue about the cause of the crisis and whether too big to fail was an issue there for a long time. But going forward, these financial institutions, the people who run them, if you talk to them, you watch their actions um, and watch the outcomes, they, they're convinced that they would be rescued. And more importantly, the credit markets feel that they're safer. And so there's a funding advantage, estimated usually between 75 and 80 basis points, from being one of these too big, too big to fail institutions. That, of course, enables them to become even bigger. I don't know that they, they're not think they're pushing on the reckless risk dimension fully at this stage because it's a cycle and you don't generally expect people to go crazy right after a massive financial crisis. But I think we will go through that cycle again, that credit cycle uh, will repeat and this time it will be uh, even more dangerous. On, on the resolution authority, um, the wind down mechanism, Karen, I, I agree, I, I, I would like to see one put in place but my question that I ask repeatedly and I ask this in public and in private of the you know, top people in the banking system and, and on capital and actually uh, in the White House is, tell me how exactly it would, work, would have worked for Lehman with a complex cross-border financial institution. If you have a wind-down mechanism or resolution authority based on US law and there's no cross-border resolution authority, it doesn't, I think, help you manage that bankruptcy particularly. I think it actually gives you a mechanism through which you can come in and do a conservatorship in the US, but that's a bailout. That's the taxpayer supporting the entity because you don't know how to unwind everything except through basically letting the contracts run off and, and absorb the losses onto the taxpayer. That's, that's not acceptable. That's protecting the creditors, of course, and that's the underpinning of the too-big-to-fail thinking and, and, and subsidy. Now, on jo John, you're, I'm sure you're right that we could construct theoretically some um, equivalent pr progressive capital requirements, make it sufficiently steep over time, and it, it would map into what, what we're saying. I think that my concerns about this, is we know it's e relatively easy to gain capital requirements. Uh, of course, one of the reactions to, to the allegations of Lehman on Repo 105, uh, one of the reactions from the financial sector, and I, I'm not saying this is true or false, but one of the things they say is, hey, everybody does that. Well, if everybody's doing that, then they're basically you know, gaming their capital requirements, which is what, or, or, and gaming the leverage, the stated amount degree of leverage, which of course is what the accusation is that, that, that Lehman was doing. And the other concern I have, John, is that any capital standards approach, and we do what we do strongly support raising capital requirements. Uh, we've actually been arguing that you should go back to the kind of capital requirements that banks had before 1913, before the Federal Reserve was created. U.S. banks carried between 20 and 30 percent capital because these bailouts were not available in any, in any form. There was no mechanism. And remember, they had contingent capital in that so-called national banking era. So if shareholders were liable not just for the money that, that they'd already put in, but they were liable for the par value of shares again to put into any bankruptcy process. That's a lot of capital. But in today's environment, any, any movement in that direction would require you to delegate authority to the regulators who in some Basel committee type of discussion would come up with some numbers. And we know where the Europeans are on bank capital. They're not in a good place. They don't have a lot of bank capital. They don't want to raise bank capital. They don't want to acknowledge the problems in their system. And, and I worry, given the statements that have been made and given the, the language that's been used by, by our Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and, and other senior officials, that we would not be pushing for enough capital. Lehman had officially 11.6% tier one capital a day or two days before it failed. Now, that may turn out to have been a fraudulent statement, an incorrect claim, we'll see. But that, that's what the official numbers are. I don't think the Basel process will end up with capital requirements on the biggest firms above 12%, for example. That would be my guess. 
Um, and I don't think that's enough. So I, I think that these, these measures are complementary. And we're suggesting that we, we add that to the portfolio. Now, as, as, as on, on Bill's points, which, which are as always, uh, always very, very good points, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot to worry about, Bill, going forward. And, and I think that, I mean, the book is trying to be forward looking. And I think, you know, we'll argue about this crisis, the cause of the 2008 crisis for a long time. And that's, that's a productive discussion. But what concerns me going forward is, is, is the, um, the deal that the banks got and their interpretation uh, of the deal. I think they, they regard themselves as essential players. They, they understand that when a crisis comes, they will play, they can play a constructive role on a crisis management basis. Do you want this entity to collapse and cause massive damage, or do you want it to be bought by J.P. Morgan Chase? Well, if you put me on that moment, in that slice of time, and those are my options, Larry Summers says, if your options are collapse or rescue, I would go with rescue. And if the rescue mechanism is, the only rescue mechanism available to me is J.P. Morgan Chase, maybe I would you know, have to swallow my pride and rip up all my books and, and, and go with that. You know? But I think the point is to avoid coming to that point. The point is to have a financial structure where when failure occurs, like CIT Group failed, they screamed last year, they screamed up and down that this would massively disrupt the provision of credit to small and medium-sized lenders. I, I don't think you can see that in the data. I don't think that's what happened. They restructured their debt. They went through effectively bankruptcy. That's a relatively small, it's not a, that's not a community bank. That's a, it's an infinite financial institution. It's relatively small compared to these too big to fail people. And I think that's what you want to move towards, as, as, um, as Morris, uh, I think, is saying. It's, it's a fail-safe. It's a, another level of protection that we have. And it's not the magic bullet. It's not the only piece. But it is the blind spot. It is the piece that is not in legislation. It is the piece that the, the Treasury and the White House are not pushing for. And to the extent it's in the Volcker rules, it's this, as, as Morris said, it's a strange notion that you would cap at today's size, which is very odd after the, after the boom and the bailout, uh, the boom, the bust, and the, and, and the, and the bailout. And on the, on the issue of capture and, ha and how would we do away with it, look, honestly, I think the big change is in the consensus. 150 years ago, I, I could have, any of us could have stood outside uh, this building in DuPont Circle and sold something in a bottle called, you know, patent medicine. And it could have had no effect, n none of the effects that we claimed for it. It could even have been poisonous. And that was okay. That was accepted. It, try and do it now. Go and do it this afternoon. And, and I'm sure you'll be arrested. Well, if anybody takes you seriously. Uh, you know, the consensus on, on what you can, do, what damages society, what is acceptable business practice, what is legitimate private interest versus reasonable social concerns, that balance shifts all the time. And I think what, what Teddy Roosevelt, I know Teddy Roosevelt shifted it dramatically over 10 years. I, I, you know, the checks and balances, the nature of democracy are such that we don't update immediately. We look at the data, we argue it out, we look for evidence, we have discussions like this. We have the kind of you know, pushback and iterations. But we do change our minds. We do figure it out. My, my concern is that we, we will wait for another mega crisis before we do it. If you have two with similar characteristics, I think we say, OK, well, OK, let's back away from this. This is, just, this is just not good for a market economy. It's not good for growth. But, but I don't want to wait. Teddy Roosevelt didn't wait. Teddy Roosevelt acted preemptively because he was concerned about the economic and political power of these massive industrial trusts. Right? They were bad for business, small business, bad for artisans, bad for farmers, bad, bad for entrepreneurs, bad for workers. And he was right. You wouldn't, none of us would want to go back and reinstate Northern, uh, Northern Securities, the massive railroad trust, or even Standard Oil. Right? FDR seized his moment in a Great Depression. And, and you know, if we have another Great Depression, perhaps we'll have another FDR. But why wait? And if you get another Great Depression, it doesn't mean you necessarily get another FDR. You may get completely crazy policies. That would not also be at odds with the historical record around the world. OK, Simon, thank you very, very much. Thanks to Morris. Don't forget to buy the book on the way out and make Simon sign it for you. And thank you all.